<clears throat> says that we're recording. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Charles Watson. Uh, my PhD is in philosophy and humanities. I'm also the program coordinator for African American Education Empowerment, uh, also known as AME. And we want to welcome you to our first uh, <clears throat> ENI Hangout with. And over the next hour, uh, we're going to uh, allow you to hang out with an argument in defense of Black History Month. <clears throat> and I'm just going to dive in. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint presentation uh, that I'll share. So I'm going to start sharing the screen. Uh, share. OK, bet. And let's see if I can make it get to the <clears throat> show. OK, there's that. And I'm going to make the little screen box a little smaller. So, and then where's the little, okay, so then I can advance. It. Okay, bet. Uh, uh, can you all uh, see uh, the PowerPoint presentation? Nod your head or someone shout me out. Is it good? Thumbs up. Hold on, I can't see the screen with your faces. So I need, somebody going to throw me the <clears throat> thumbs up? Yes. Okay, bet. Thank you very much. A little call and response. So I'm going to set it off. An argument in defense of Black History Month. See if I can move the transcription screen so I can see all of this with that. Argument in defense of Black History Month, Dr. Charles H. Watson. Okay, where's the, okay, that was the next, hold on, let me see if I can do this. Okay, okay, there's the screen, okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, I wanna say something about our learning outcomes. Uh, one, to bring <clears throat> from concealment the unasked question, uh, I'm gonna move these screens around. The unasked question posed by calls of why the need for a Black History Month. Two, to articulate an epistemology of embodied historical trauma and a theory of collective identity. Three, to demonstrate the study of Black history as empathy operationalized and strategy for unlearning miseducation. And then fourth, uh, to illustrate how empathy, what I understand as the movement of kinetic inclusion, uh, which might be a theme for another talk, uh, collapses the distance between self and other, thereby disclosing the invisible inner law, which is a reference to an idea from King that we may talk more about. See if I can get this screen back up to advance the next slide. Okay. Uh, to bring out from concealment the unasked question posed by calls of why the need, all this stuff on the screen, why the need for a Black History Month. The origin story of Black History Month inevitably leads to Carter G. Woodson. So, if nothing else, that's a concrete takeaway, a historical figure we should all know a little about. Carter G. Woodson. As historians have tried to pinpoint Woodson's initial reason for creating the week-long observance, the week-long observance, uh, many agree <clears throat> that a negative interaction at Harvard University played a critical role in its creation. Woodson shared with a colleague that one of his professors at Harvard during a class lecture made the statement that, and this is a quote from the Harvard professor from that platform of classroom instruction, quote, the Negro has no history, end quote. Woodson is said to have challenged his professor by saying, quote, no people lacked a history. His professor, Edwards Channing, challenged Woodson to prove him wrong. Woodson chose to devote his life and genius to discovering missing pages of history, the facts about achievement and heroism of Black people, the history of America that had been left out of the one-sided, white-oriented school text. The Harvard professor denies existence of history of a people Woodson knows to exist in virtue of his own experience. The ever unasked question as framed by Du Bois and Souls of Black Folk is, how does it feel to be a problem? That's a reference from Du Bois. The experience of being a problem to solve an object of study shows itself in the ceaseless questioning 
dare I say, scrutiny of black identity and racial group membership. Peoplehood is called into question by the denial of history. Yet again, the Negro must ever prove or legitimize their worth to the surveillance of white authority. What's at stake? Problem status. These are the things at stake. The ontology of the race category, the standing, uh, things keep popping up. Uh, sorry about that. Skipped. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, what's at stake? Uh, the ontology of the race category, the standing of a Black American people, a theory of collective identity and group solidarity. A simple search of the topic, quote, why Black History Month is important, and I actually did this, all right, uh, generates the following menu of viewing options on YouTube, right? These are things you can find on YouTube with a simple search, why Black History Month is important. You can find, why do we celebrate Black History Month? Why Black History Month shouldn't exist? Kids explain Black History Month. Black history is American history. Why do we still need Black History Month? Black history matters. What is Black History Month and why is it important? We need to get rid of Black History Month. Oh uh, man, this thing is all in the way. Let's see if I can make this. Uh, can't see the top of this screen. Hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, Harvard professor, let's see, how can I get the screen? So hold on, I might have to get out of this mode so I can see it. Okay, uh, Harvard professor's denial equals the workings of cultural imperialism. That was the top of the screen that I couldn't see. We'll get back, okay, bet. Harvard professor's denial is equivalent to a version of cultural imperialism. Um, this is a quote from Iris Young. Uh, to experience cultural imperialism means to experience how the dominant meanings of a society render the particular perspective of one's own group invisible at the same time as they stereotype one's group and mark it out as the other. Cultural imperialism involves the universalization of a dominant group's experience and culture and its establishment as the norm. The culturally dominated undergo a paradoxical oppression in that they are both marked out by stereotypes and at the same time rendered invisible. As remarkable deviant beings, the culturally imperialized are stamped with an essence the stereotypes confine them to a nature which is often attached in some way to their bodies and which thus cannot easily be denied. Cultural imperialism involves the paradox of experiencing oneself as invisible at the same time that one is marked out as different. The invisibility comes about when dominant groups fail to recognize the perspective embodied in their cultural expressions as a perspective, and this was from Iris Young. Let's try to get to the next slide now. Okay, so am I doing this right? Back. Okay. I want, uh, so we already did this slide. Share that again. Okay, now next slide. The Harvard press professor's denial executes two distinct agendas. So in that claim that the Negro has no history, the Harvard professor's denial executes two distinct agendas, the denigration of Woodson and the supremacy of what I call the normative white gaze. These two agendas are embodied, and I'm gonna to return to these themes of both disfigurement and asymmetry. Disfigurement tracks nicely with those that know Resma's work around uh, embody trauma, what is sort of captured in and on the body, we'll say more about that. And then the asymmetry is the growing space between Woodson and the instructor, both vertically, superiority and inferiority, but also, dare I say longitudinally, that is to say, the conditions for genuine dialogue are not present. 
because there is no mutuality and reciprocity in that context of asymmetry. So there are two agendas, right? Um, the denigration of Woodson, the supremacy of the normative white gaze, these two agendas are embodied, disfigurement and asymmetry. Time is worn upon the body. We'll say more about time in a minute. And the body remembers its scars. Let me get to the next slide. Uh, so now this is a, a quote from uh, King. Uh, you can see the reference at the bottom. I'm trying to move this around so I can see it. Okay. Um, this is the ultimate tragedy of segregation. It not only harms one physically, but it injures one spiritually. It scars the soul and distorts the personality. It inflicts the segregator with a false sense of superiority while inflicting the segregated with a false sense of inferiority. The tragedy of segregation, insert cultural imperialism, right? So we've already referenced Iris Young, so you see this, this, this connection. The tragedy of segregation is that it treats persons as means rather than ends and thereby reduces them to things rather than persons. To use the words of Martin Buber, segregation, insert cultural imperialism, substitutes an I-it relationship for the I-thou relationship. And that's a reference from King. Uh, it shows up in two locations in 58 and 62. You see the two essays. Okay, next. Um, uh, to move into the next learning goal, to articulate an epistemology of embodied historical trauma and a theory of collective identity. I want to make sure I'm on track with the slides. Okay, back. Because the diagram is coming, right? Make sure. Okay, back, right there. So now I want to articulate an epistemology of embodied historical trauma and a theory of collective identity. These are Watson's ideas. I want to understand racism as a form of self-deception, a training in the practice of forgetfulness. Racism as a form of self-deception, a training in the practice of forgetfulness, dependent upon. So this training and the practice of forgetfulness is dependent upon the objectification, subordination, and exclusion that correspond with faith and opposite values, violating the worth of human personality, turning persons into things, and substituting price for dignity. This is King's understanding of how Kant's categorical imperative is violated, right? Violating the worth of human personality, turning persons into things and substituting price for dignity, racism justifies inequality in status. Such unequal treatment and unfair outcomes are validated by the notion that there are superior as well as inferior races. The belief in an inescapable racial supremacy or the supposedly unavoidable hierarchy ensuing from a racial caste system creates a twofold fracture and schism, a twofold fracture and schism, a physical separation as well as a spiritual disassociation due to the supposition that inferiority compels subordination and demands exclusion. We are physically apart, spiritually disaffected, and materially uneven, one type over the day, uh, materially uneven. The casting of persons as things, I understand this as being locked up. The denigration of value in the scale of rank to be locked in and the silence from invisibility to be locked out, right? Locked up, locked in, locked out. Um, racism forecloses the possibility of genuine dialogue, whereas a constructive theory of difference enables 
the radical hospitality of translation. How is 350 years of miseducation both embodied and unlearned? Frederick Douglass gives us resources to talk about embodied and intergenerational asymmetries. King describes scars, harm to the soul, and distortion of personality. Okay, so now we're going to play with time for a minute. So insert diagram. I want to escape from this. I want to stop sharing for a minute. Okay, y'all with me out there? I don't, okay, I got to get some call and response, you know. That, that oral tradition. So I'm going to share a different screen with y'all now. And I want to, um, this is the improvised portion, uh, not, not on the script. So, so I, want to, I want to play with two uh, passages. Let's see. Okay. Let's not worry about the Bob Marley reference yet. Okay. So can you see this little Word document I've got going? Somebody's nodding. Okay, yep. yeah. okay, thank you very much. Okay, so here's what I want to play with for a second. I'm going to walk you through two citations, and we're going to play with their temporality a bit. Um, and so let me start with this one. So here's the story that I want to now tell. I want to tell a story about how the I-thou relationship, right, an I-thou relationship, which would be the conditions for genuine dialogue, mutuality and reciprocity, where I see the you that's in me and the me that's in you. How do we convert an I-thou uh, relationship into this I-it relation? This brings us back to my account of both disfigurement, namely embodied trauma, as well as asymmetry, right? So if you could imagine, and that's why I said insert diagram, because I'm sort of drawing it with my hands. If you can imagine on one side of your sheet of paper, the I-thou relationship, and on the other side of your piece of paper, the I-it relation, and you were to draw an arch of this sort of conversion, how do we get from I-thou to I-it? And it would be like an arcing, like almost the circle of a clock. Because then what we want to do is tell a story about how do we move that I-it relation back toward the I-thou relationship. Okay, so now in order to tell a story about disfigurement and asymmetry, I want to start with Frederick Douglass. And I want to read you a quote. You already see the year that Douglass scripts this quote, 1866, from an essay called The Future of the Colored Race. So Douglass is writing this one year after the end of the American Civil War. I'll read the quote, and I'm interested in its content, but I'm really going to focus on its temporality. Look at what Douglass says. We all know what the Negro has been as a slave. In this relation, we have his experience of 250 years before us. And we can easily know the character and qualities he has developed and exhibited during his long and severe ordeal. In his new relation to his environment, we see him only in the twilight of 20 years of semi-freedom. For he has scarcely been free long enough to outgrow the marks of the lash on his back and the fetters on his limbs. He stands before us today physically a maimed and mutilated man. His mother was lashed to agony before the birth of her babe, and the bitter anguish of the mother is seen in the countenance of her offspring. So already, whatever it is you think Resma is doing in my grandmother's hands, in 1866, Douglas already has a theory of embodied trauma and intergenerational trauma. He's narrating it right here. His mother was lashed to agony before the birth of her babe, and the bitter anguish of the mother is seen in the countenance of her offspring. Slavery has twisted his limbs, shattered his feet, deformed his body, and distorted his features. He remains black but no longer comely, sleeping on the dirt floor of the slave cabin in infancy, cold on one side and warm on the other, a forced circulation of blood on the one side and chilled and retarded circulation on the other. It has come to pass that he is not uh, it has come to pass that he is not the vertical bearing of a perfect man. His lack of symmetry caused by no fault of his own. So right here, this gets us to all of the conversation about your ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences, the social determinants of health. Douglas is talking about the material conditions that make flourishing possible, right? Or the conditions, the oppressive conditions that lead to this kind of embodied disfigurement, right? This lack of symmetry. 
caused by no fault of his own creates a resistance to his progress, which cannot be, which cannot well be overestimated and should be taken into account when measuring his speed in the new race of life upon which he has now entered. As I've often said before, we should not measure the Negro from the heights with which the white race has attained, but from the depths from which he has come. Okay, so let's sit with this for a second. The content is rich. I want to play with the temporality of it. So Douglas is writing in 1866, some simple math, because I'm not doing any sophisticated math. He's writing in 1866. We say, we know what this experience has been for 250 years. 1866, right? Minus 250 gives you 1616. So that would be Douglas's origin date. So let's hold on to that. He's writing from 1868, talking about something that we know this experience for 250 years, which would then uh, originate in 1616. Okay, now let's look at this quote from Martin King. King is writing this in 1968 in a chapter from, where do we go from here, Chaos of Community, the chapter is called The Dilemma of Negro Americans. And look at what King says, after 348 years, racial injustice is still the Negro's burden and America's shame. Yet for his own inner health and outer functioning, the Negro is called upon to be as resourceful, as productive, and as responsible as those who have not known such oppression and exploitation. This is the Negro's dilemma. He who starts behind in a race must forever remain behind and run faster than the man in front. What a dilemma. It is a call to do the impossible. It is enough to cause the Negro, Negro to give up and despair. So if you take 1968 and then you subtract uh, 348 years, that would give you 1620 as King's origin date, right? So that's within the margin of error, 1660. On one hand, 1620. Okay, so now, even if you were to be optimistic enough to say, well, but something gets solved in 1968, which I don't think, um, I, I don't want to call anyone naive, right? But I, I think that would be a hard pressed claim to defend. So we then move from 1968 to the current date, 2022. That would be an additional 54 years. And if you added that to 1968, that would bring the total to 402. And then famously, the, the Bob Marley and the Whalers write a song called 400 Years. I'm not playing with the temporality of that, because then you can ask, well, what year is Marley writing that? And then that gets us to a story about Jamaica's history. And just sit with me for a second and say, okay, Let's take as this ballpark number, remember that I down to the I it, right? Because between 1968 and now, right, in terms of benchmarks, at least these are the moments that I saw fit to call out. The Rodney King beating happens in 1991. Cornell West publishes Race Matters in 1994 and sort of dedicates his work on that to the Rodney King incident. Certainly we know George Floyd was murdered May 25th, 2020. We haven't, it's not been two years since that. And that's just organizing this discourse about um, locked up, locked in, locked out through the lens of violence against black bodies. There are any number of other ways we could slice that up. Racial health disparities, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, looking at um, uh, house ownership, uh, employment, education. There's so many ways to make the argument that empirically we're still within that frame, right? So if you buy me at least on the 400 year number, keep the math simple. A generation is understood to be anywhere from 20 to 30 years. So let's take 25 years to keep the math simple. 400, right? If you divide that by 25, that's 16 generations. 16. Sit with that. I, I can stop sharing my screen for a minute because I did what I want to do with the text. 16 generations of this movement from the I thou to the I it, 16 generations. So whatever we think we did in a 10 year window or 20, right? 16 generations of this disfigurement harms the soul, scars personality, as well as asymmetry. So that's what I want you to sort of imagine in that insert diagram box, right? That this story I'm trying to tell about this arc of movement from I thou to I it, and now we want to tell a story about, well, how do we move the I, it back toward the I, thou? Certainly nothing that any of us could think might easily be achieved in any one of our lifetimes when we're working against 16 generations, right? Um, 
the point that I want to make to get back to the PowerPoint slides, um, famously, Carter G. Woodson uh, uh, writes, uh, what is it, 1931, 1932, no later than 33, the miseducation of the Negro. Um, and so um, the question that I always like to pose is, how do we unlearn this miseducation? And my answer, which brings us back to the PowerPoint slide, is we have to learn to remember what we're trained to forget. Remember, racism is a training in oblivion, a training in forgetfulness. So if you want to undo the Jim and Jane Crow miseducation, we then have to learn to remember the things that we're trained to forget in our Black history. So now let me get back to the slides. Okay, so that was my effort at the insert diagram bit. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Okay, we're okay. So let's keep pushing. Here we go. We must learn to remember the things we are trained to forget and racism is a training in forgetfulness. This answers the fundamental concern of my normative project. Why does the participation or experience of difference matter? Alternative values, alternating voices, and alterations of viewpoint. What useful functions and constructive purposes might the participation or experience of difference serve? Interruption, halting the work of systems to bring their operation out from concealment. Subversion, overturn establishment orders of rank and tables of value. By, cent by centering, by centering stories from the margins, recreation. So we got interruption, subversion, recreation to draw anew the boundaries of translation as radical hospitality. These are key reasons why difference matters. And on another occasion, maybe you'll let me deliver a paper I have under that title, Why Difference Matters. The participation or experience of difference contributes to excellence of function. I mean this in a, an Aristotelian sense in three key ways. Cognitively, how we change our minds, grow to understand new truths, and stay woke to the threat of self-deception. Systemically, how we dismantle cultural imperialism by bringing its faith and opposite values out from concealment while shining light on the paradox of being marked and rendered invisible. Relationally, how we recover, recollect, or recollect, how we recover, recollect or draw again the boundaries for genuine dialogue. The participation, oh, sorry. The participation or experience of difference is kinetic inclusion. A complementary rather than oppositional or binary theory of difference, kinetic inclusion closes the space. Remember that I thou to I it relationship is all about, all about this asymmetry and the distance between self and other. Kinetic inclusion closes the space between self and other, cultivating the moral sentiment of empathy by disclosing that by disclosing the you that's in me and revealing the me found in you. And this brings us back to King on the Inner Invisible Law. Black History Month exemplifies kinetic inclusion as the way of creative protest. And for those that have heard me speak during our MLK Day activities, particularly last year, you know how central this concept of creative protest is for both me and King. To question the legitimacy of a people's story of accomplishment and contribution, and whether it's worthy of recognition and celebration, Black History Month resolves any dispute about justification. Black History Month is an annual observance, a time set aside to honor the past in the spirit of the corrective, appreciate the present 
in the spirit of the descriptive and work toward the future in the spirit of the prophetic. Now, this is something, this, this, this framework, the corrective, descriptive, and prophetic is something that I draw from Manning Marable, who says that the Black intellectual tradition ought to do three things. It ought to be corrective, right? Correcting not only uh, falsity, but also omission. It ought to be descriptive, right? To tell a story about the current experience and predicament of a people. That's the presentist value of it. But it also needs to be prophetic, which is in the spirit of social justice, right? Working toward the future. Uh, the observance of Black History Month does all these three things. Dr. Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of Black history, and for good reason. He took it upon himself to write Black people into American history and champion the idea that Black people should know their own history. In 1915, Woodson and friends established the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in Chicago. A year later, he established the Journal of Negro History. In 1926, he developed Negro History Week, later expanded to Black History Month in the 1960s. Black History Month is a concrete expression of heritage, an opportunity to promote cultural awareness, and an example of everyday resistance by claiming pride in collective accomplishments. Historians remind us that, quote, Woodson founded Negro History Week to be observed between the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln, February 12, and Frederick Douglass, February 14. Three days total, framed by abolition and emancipation, a modest intervention generated seismic transformation. We have all benefited from Woodson's act to define a time to discuss Black life. His act led faculty and students at Kent State University to extend Black history to a month-long celebration. His act continues to support Woodson's belief, another typo, we got to work on that, belief espoused in 1939 that, quote, the aim of this generation should be to collect the records of the Negro and treat them scientifically in order that the race may not become a negligible factor in the thought of the world. So I ask each of you, what will be your act to contribute to Black history's preservation. So then we did some breakout rooms because we did this as a uh, professional learning series training thing. We'll have our breakout rooms by way of Q&A at the end of our time together. Um, to demonstrate the study of Black history as empathy operationalized and strategy for unlearning miseducation. I'm winding it down, coming to the home stretch. What is history? Why do we study it? Why are the production, distribution, and consumption of history related to issues of power, politics, and legitimacy? I want to present five themes that organize my thoughts on the nature of history. They are time, narrative, the geography of memory, identity and community or cultural heritage as collective belonging, as well as perspective. Time, narrative, the geography of memory, identity and community or the cultural heritage and collective belonging, as well as perspective. First, time. History is a recollection of the past that illuminates an understanding of the present for the sake of positive advance in the future. Second, narrative. History is the story we tell about from where we come, what things were like back then. How did we get from there to here? Where and who are we now as a function of the road we travel? Third, history is about, I can't take this off the screen. Um, give me one second. 
Third, history is about the geography of memory. How do we configure? History is about the geography of memory. How do we configure, organize, or arrange that landscape of remembrance? What interests or agendas are served by giving visibility and voice to select monuments, milestones, and mishaps of the past? Fourth, history is about identity and community or cultural heritage and collective belonging. As a window that doubles as a mirror, history affords us both recognition and reflection, thereby enabling us to locate our position, thereby enabling us to locate or position the self in social space, while at the same time establishing membership or participation in a shared collective experience, forging a bond between personal identity and group solidarity. Lastly, history is about perspective, location. That is to say where we've been, are, and going, right? Location is relational. There is an interdependence between where I am and where others have been. Advancement is contextual. The road ahead has been conditioned, paved, or provisionally mapped by the journey behind. A prophetic moving forward requires a critical looking back. In other words, progress is retrospective. To know where we're going, perhaps even how best to get there or why that's the appropriate destination, is to pay mindful attention to what has gone before. As legendary historian John Hendrick Clark famously stated, quote, history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells a people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go, what they still must be. Winding it down, here's the conclusion. Amnesia, omissions, and distortions represent the blind spots for any historical frame of reference. Therefore, the only antidote to the politics of exclusion, structural subordination, and a culture of silence is inhabiting the temple of ancestral memory. Otherwise stated, we must learn to remember the things that we are trained to forget. Okay, winding it up. Aletheia, right? Aletheia is the Greek word for truth, which is also translated as disclosure or unconcealedness. In classical Greek mythology, lethe is a river in Hades whose water caused forgetfulness of the past in those who drank it. Thus, we can see the sense in the term's meaning. Lethe means oblivion, forgetfulness, and concealment. So the Greek word for truth, aletheia, 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 pardon my Greek uh, pronunciation. So the Greek word for truth, aletheia, means to unforget, or rather collect together again elements wanting to vanish from sight. The truth of history is to remember or bring out from concealment how the production of knowledge is merely that, a construction, a contrivance, an artifact of human invention in service to the needs of life, whether it's hers, ours, or theirs, his story, you get me, is simply a story that we tell ourselves and elect to believe based upon some proper ration or ratio, right? The proper ration of empirical evidence and ideological commitment. 
here are two questions of critique that must be critically posed to any historical account as such. First, in its very act of disclosure, what does the narrative seek to conceal? Second, what or whose interests are served by the simultaneity of presence and invisibility? Ta -da. I think that's the end of, that was the last slide, right? 27 out of 27. Bet. And we're right about at 45. I can stop sharing. Those are my prepared remarks uh, in the spirit of offering an argument in defense of Black History Month. Hope you could see there are many moving parts to the position. Uh, I will now uh, pause, catch a breath, and open up the floor for question, comment, discussion, uh, as I would do uh, when I would uh, host our AME Spotlights. Uh, I guess now I'm on the hot seat. Uh, I would invite you to uh, unmute yourself, share whatever comment or, or thought or question or elaboration you'd like, uh, and then give me a chance to do something with it. And if I'm unable to, I will respectfully pass. So I, I turn the floor to the audience. Thank you. I find your presentation really enlightening, um, very dense. So I'm hoping that you share these slides so that I can just kind of um, take some time with them. But I, I really found it, um, the presentation to be enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I agree. And my um, sentiments are likewise. You, it actually resonated with me. I thought about the quote, um, I believe it's Maya, Dr. Maya Angelou, who once said that history, despite its wretching pain, if gone unknown, will be relived, lived again. And so it really, that really resonated uh, with me. I recently picked up my copy of um, The Miseducation of the Negro to reread. And so I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to say that um, um, I'm a member of St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral and we are in the middle of, well, actually started um, the Circle of the Beloved and we're reading the book, The Church Cracked Open. And it discusses how the Episcopal Church systematically supported slavery and how there were people within it who spoke up um, against that. And so now because Bishop Curry um, and our Minnesota Bishop Loya are both pushing for laity um, outreach and to do the things you're mentioning, establish relationships. This is so important and I'm happy to be a part of it. I'm um, friends with a, a woman who uh, was a scholar at Minneapolis College. She's about to graduate from um, Metro State, and she's pursuing a criminal justice degree for uh, being a pro probation officer for women's incarceration. And women typically get much more severe sentences than men do, even though they are you know, strike back at the people that are beating them up uh, and even kill them, but nope, they get uh, much punished much harder. So uh, I, I like to suggest her story is also um, something we need to look at. And, and this whole white supremacy thing where you're, this is okay and everybody else is not okay. And I, I've always been an outsider. My mother was the teacher of everybody that all the other teachers crashed in a faculty lounge. And so I grew up with this celebrate differences and bring out the, the, um, the abilities of your students. And I, I teach at Anoka Ramsey Community College. And um, I've, I've seen students grow and develop when they are believed in. And so that's my mission right now is to continue to make these connections. So St. Mark's has a 
the Lionheart Scholarship Program with Minneapolis College that gives scholarships to homeless and first generation students. But all they do is write checks. And so I, <laughs> I wanna see them get in there and be friends like I am with my friend Delia. And when she said that she just wanted people to accept her, you know, I said, well, hey, I couldn't do what you're doing. I couldn't be a single mom and raise teenagers and grow up in the advent of uh, the aftermath of the George Floyd murder and then move to Brooklyn Center just in time to see Donnie Wright get murdered and more riots in your neighborhood. I can be behind you. And, and I, so we've gotten to be very good friends. But it isn't just a matter of the white lady helping the black lady up. It's she's helping me too, as I'm a widow. I live alone. So we just send each other encouraging emails every day. And that's the little bit I can do. I'm too chicken to go march, but I can be in the background helping people believe in themselves and get where they're going. So I'm very, very grateful for the vulnerability you've put on display and your sharing. Uh, I can hear the deep wellsprings of compassion from you. I want to shout out our upcoming uh, Women's History Month celebration. Don't want to unveil our theme just yet of my colleague in American Indian success, Brooke Hornseth and I, uh, along um, uh, with our colleague uh, uh, in the uh, Lucha program. Um, we're working together to get together uh, the programming for Women's History Month, which is in March. So I wanna shout that out in terms of that acknowledgement of her story. And so please be on the lookout uh, for our programming in March to get after exactly the topic. There were a few things I wanted to quickly respond to in the comment and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly, and I'm willing to hang out for as long as, as, as folk are inclined to. I know we're, we're framed to an hour. So there were a couple things that struck me. Um, one, I want to underscore again the power of what I'm calling kinetic inclusion, right? This ability for interruption, subversion, and recreation. One, and, and I like sort of classical frames. One uh, frame introduced by Simone de Beauvoir and her introduction to the second sex, she famously talks about the relationship between the one, right, and the other, right? The center and the margin, right? And the way you can sort of imagine this, right? whether you want a circle with the center and, and right into the edge, right out to the, the, the radius, or even the notion of a donut hole, right? That there's a kind of a center and then there's the sort of the margin. And what I mean by this uh, cultural imperialism's commitment to opposite values, binary opposition, is there is no alteration or alternation. There is no passing of the mic. The one or the center is set and the margin is permanently excluded. That brings us to this disfigurement and asymmetry I was talking about. So the minute that you see the power of kinetic inclusion, you're interrupting, subverting, disrupting, and recreating, right, that distance between margin and center. And now you're getting to what I want to call a, a dynamic or a sort of a intersubjective or interrelational moment, back to the I-thou relationship, where I see the you that's in me and the me that's in you. But that only happens by sharing the mic, right? We don't speak in one language. That would be the imperialist gesture. There's the language of the center, and you all have to speak the language of the center. And if you don't, whatever it is you're trying to say, I'm not trying to hear it. I'm trying to exclude it. So the end goal, alternative values, alternating voices, and alterations of viewpoint, I think the inclusion of Black History Month and its content lends itself to what I wanna call kinetic inclusion. And again, I have a talk on the why difference matters. We could wind that up some other occasion, but that's kind of the, 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 the sort of some of the argument in a nutshell. But I'll turn it back over to the floor and uh, see if there are other questions or comments. Uh, definitely wanna shout out my colleague in the philosophy department. I see Matthew Palumbo on the line. Matthew, if you wanna dive in or, or get at it, I, I'm, you know, where, you know, the, the floor, not to put any pressure on you, uh, uh, brother, but you know, I just just wanted. To, I know you're there, and want to always shout out the philosophers. Well, I, I do want to express my appreciation. This was great, Charles, um, as always. And you know, I, I I kind of really appreciate the the doubleness of Black History Month, both as the kinetic energy restoring the I thou empathy on the one hand. Uh, but also the 
the value of, of um, community identity and cultural heritage and that, and that there's both. Um, I have kind of a strategic question for you. Um, you probably are very aware of this kind of assault on critical race theory in the public schools and K-12. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that this is a, a, a very ideological move, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering your thoughts on where and how Black History Month plays into that. I mean, is that a kind of, you know, also assault on Black History uh, Month? Can Black History Month be a way of, uh, can we, can we draw on how you talk about Black history as a counter to uh, that that um, assault on critical race theory, which ends up being a kind of um, critique of any critique of the center, right? <laughs> like so, right, right. I'm just kind of mm -hmm. wondering your your thoughts and whether you've kind of made that connection between Black History Month and that growing assault uh, that we we hear a lot about. First of all, I want to thank you for your comment, as always, so insightful. I want to say, man, you read my mind because we're working on a summit, Indigenous Men and Men of Color Summit, for April 15th, and I'm trying to bring somebody in to talk about this very topic. What is critical race theory, right? Why is it so besieged, right? And why we still need it. So, so it's kind of ill to, to have that thrown at me. Um, and so I would say a couple things. I think. Uh, I think that you're absolutely, let me take a step back. Here's a very simple minded view. Uh, and I'll tell a very quick anecdote. Um, I have taught in a few other locations before I arrived here. And when I was in Indiana, I worked at a small liberal arts college and I taught a course, uh, undergraduate humanities course called interpretive practices. And I really like this metaphor of lenses that we sort of encounter the world through um, an epistemic frame of reference the medium through which and by which we interpret the world. And I would always say to students, there are a lot of different lenses that you could bring to your interpretation of a text. You could bring a psychoanalytic lens. So we wanna do a kind of Freudian analysis of things, right? You could bring a labor analysis, right? We're gonna do a sort of labor history analysis of America through the lens of labor and work, right? Um, you could do a gender analysis, right? We're going to analyze the text through the lens of how it understands gender. Okay, well, race is just another kind of epistemic framework or frame of reference through which and by which we put on those lenses. Whoa, what do we see? What do we see? So absolutely, the assault on critical race studies or critical race theory is a training in forgetfulness. We don't want y'all seeing through that lens. We don't wanna be read through the eyes of a critical race analysis. Here's one thing that I've always said about that normative white gaze. The minute it acknowledges the reality of black experience, it also has to acknowledge the reality of white experience, right? It would then cast into relief. It would bring out from concealment the normative white gaze. So if I'm determined to not acknowledge the normative white gaze, I have to deny black experience. I can't allow anything that would help me to then realize, oh my God, these black people are really on to something. I get it, I see it. Because then you become, right? Or at least the group known as white people or the normative white gaze then becomes a character in the story. And we don't like where that leads. So we're gonna just kind of cut off the legs that even get that story off the ground. So so yeah, I, I see, um, I always ask the question now, and with this, I see there are things happening in the chat. Pardon me for not being able to keep up with the chat. As I say, sometimes I can't walk and chew gum. Um, but um, you know, you know, one of the things I always ask: whose interests are served by whatever the argument is? Like, what interest, what agenda, what ideology is served and supported by the denial, the omission? Right. Same thing with this discourse about being colorblind. All of the tropes of enlightenment speak against any kind of blindness. So now why would we want to be blind? So I think the critique of critical race theory is another effort at a certain kind of blindness, right? A certain kind of lethe or forgetfulness. So, so but we're going to keep talking about that because we're going to bring in someone that's more versed in that, uh, that subject area to, to, to say more about it. I know we're a little after two. Again, 
I'm grateful for those that have stayed on. If there are any further questions or comments from the floor, I'm happy. I don't want anyone to feel like they, they didn't get a chance to be heard if they're still on the line. So I'll, 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 I'll again, pause. Dr. Watson, I'm going to throw a question out to you. My name is Phil Gwoki. Thank you so much for your uh, insights today. Really value uh, the body of work that I'm sure represents years of research uh, <laughs> pulled into 45 minutes of content. Thank you. My question is, uh, I'm really intrigued when you talked about 16 generations of experience. And uh, as someone who I believe must work with students, I'm curious within the black community, what, if anything, might you have noticed in terms of the shift, maybe even the last 50 years from our experiential base uh, perspective of uh, definition of black excellence, let's say. You know, as a community, we have this sh shared experience that goes back 16 uh, generations, as you described, but you know, I'm curious when it comes to young people today versus, you know, people who are say in their 30s and 40s versus 50s and 60s versus maybe 70s and beyond, how, how is this being perceived? What's going on from one generation to the next uh, in our living communities? That's an excellent question. Thank you for throwing that at me, Phil. And in the spirit of what I can accomplish in 45 minutes, I definitely can't cover sort of 16 <laughs> generations of right, but, but here's, here's my immediate reaction to what you're saying. Um, so, and again, by way of an anecdote, because as a guy that's in higher education, also something, and again, for those that need to drop off the call, I respect that. I'm grateful for those that are hanging out. I'll hang out until whatever comment or question is heard. Um, so, um, I, uh, last semester, did a virtual talk show called AME Spotlights. And we did it for about 15 weeks. We brought people from all different kinds of walks of life and experience and to sort of share their stories. One question that I asked everybody in the opening was, um, what role did education play in your upbringing? And what I noticed was that there was consistently two varieties of answer. Either it was, mommy and daddy demanded it of me. It was a parental requirement. It was a parental expectation. They'd say, I didn't get any rewards for getting A's because that was expected. Or the answer was education was seen as a way out, as liberatory, as emancipatory in service to, hey man, I was in a situation I didn't want to be anymore and I wanted to get out. And I saw my book learning, my educational pursuit as the way to get to a better life for me as well as for my family. So I wonder if the current generation, and we're gonna do a, a breakout session on this at our uh, Indigenous Men and Men of Color Summit, circle your calendars, uh, April 15th, um, on the value of higher education. Because remember in Douglas's slave narrative, right? Whatever it was the master was trying to keep from him, that's what he wanted. And Douglas heard the master, Thomas Holt, say, I think mm -hmm. the wife's name was Mary, that, oh, you yep. can't teach him to read and write. That will unfit him to be a slave. So Douglas was like, that's exactly the thing I want to go for. So the question, is education still emancipation? I wonder if that view is still held. Mm -hmm. So there, there are two things that I wonder about in the current generation. What's the parental influence? To what extent are mommy and daddy saying, this is a must, this is a requirement, this is a value, the household is built on this, I didn't get it, but I'm going to make sure you get it, whatever. Or are they convinced that study, education, higher learning is really the pathway to liberation? I, I, I don't know if those values still hold. So mm -hmm. that then frustrates or problematizes a discourse around black excellence, because respectfully, I'm no social media expert, but there's a kind of immediacy and quickness that, hey, I could be a YouTube influencer or make a 15 second TikTok, whatever, you get what I'm saying. And the quickness with which you, you think you could sort of show up, well, then why would I go to college for four years or, or that kind of worry? So I think that for me 
would be a centerpiece frustration in terms of that shift, whether or not uh, uh, those values that once anchored us mm -hmm. continue to anchor us. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because your argument is so strong and yet I'm trying to think of ways to even make it within the community for young people today, you know, because it, I think what you shared is so accurate. There seems to be a disconnect between even the value of learning and how you how you framed it in terms of this is really an effort to combat what we were forced not to learn. <laughs> right, know. right, right. Right, right. Um, what has been disclosed, you know, what has been hidden, you know, we have to unveil it. And that is the pathway out. Right. I just want to say one other quick thing and then take the next set of comments or questions. You know, let, let's think that we'll hang out, you know, at least I'll, I'll, I'll say at least until 215. So if anybody else wants to bounce, I get it. Um, one thing that's interesting about the discourse about thank you uh, about the discourse around excellence. I think about that in an Aristotelian sense. For, for Aristotle, excellence is about flourishing. It's about performing one's function well. And so then the question becomes, what are the conditions for the possibility of flourishing mm -hmm. for what Aristotle will call the health of the soul? And what role does education play, right, as a sort of nutrient in the achievement of that flourishing, that excellence of performance, that outcome, to live well, to do well? That's what Aristotle means by your diamond knee or happiness. I'll take one step back and then I'll entertain other comments and then we can be winding it down. One thing that I so often hear, and I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and I grew up in a place where for many people, they're born, raised, live, die on the block. The block is the limit of their horizon. That's the limit of their world. So, so much of what we need to do is open up the horizon of possibility. Because what structural inequality wants to do is lock us in the box, locked up, locked in, locked out. You're limited to only this. So if we can just expand the horizon of possibility. The thing that I'm gonna be talking about to a group of Hopkins, uh, 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 Brooke and I will be this coming Friday, a group of Hopkins high school students that are gonna come to campus. I'm gonna challenge them to dare to dream. Dare to dream, because I think that is another crisis. It's a crisis of imagination, because you can't even entertain alternative possibilities to what it is you're locked into. And I think that's what the study of Black history can afford, right? It's this narrative exemplification of striving in the context of adverse circumstances, because there's no way to think that anybody in the sort of pantheon of historical figures had an easier situation or more available resources than we currently do, and yet they persevered. I use the Langston Hughes poem, Mother to Son. Mm -hmm. if you know that poem, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the idea, to dare them to dream and then to introduce them to alternatives. Expand that horizon of possibility. Let them meet professionals that look like them that are doing things. One last trite example. I have a, a colleague that works at um, Northwestern Health Sciences University. And one thing that they point out is why aren't chiropractors, acupuncturists, massage therapists, traditional Chinese medicine? When you get these like um, um, inventories or surveys of prospective occupations, you never see those things on a list. So it's not even in a, in, in a young person's field of view to think, wait a minute, I could be a massage therapist? What is it that even? Acupuncture, chiropractic, like what's that? So I think that's what we have to sort of, that's a part of the interrupt, subvert, disrupt, right? Kind of strategy. And I think the study of black history can open up that horizon of possibility. You Thank know? you so much. Of course, any other closing thoughts, questions, comments before we all go to lunch? Everybody, everybody feels good. Well, listen, I just want to thank y'all for hanging out this long. Uh, please be on the lookout. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, please be on the lookout for uh, more programming coming out of the ENI division through the month of February for Black History Month, and then moving into March for uh, Women's History Month. Um, please be in touch with me. Um, this is being recorded, so I'll find a way to share the link. 
if you just want me to, to, to share the PowerPoint slide, I'm easy to find charles.watson at minneapolis.edu and share the work with you, let you know about upcoming events. I'm grateful for your presence. I'm grateful for your attention, for hanging in there with me. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Be well and please be in touch.